Welcome to Connecting the Dots. My name is Mark Lardner. Thank you all for being here. This is the show where we talk about the application of TCOM data to improve transformational opportunities for children, families, and adults. And I'm really happy that you're here. If this is your first time tuning into this program, uh, make sure you click like. Uh, that's that thumbs up button you see on YouTube. And subscribe to the channel. That'll help you stay up to date, stay informed about all the videos we're posting on this channel. Usually there's something new every week uh, being posted. Um, so uh, we are back from our three month hiatus over the summer. And at this moment, uh, if you're watching this live, we are three weeks out from our TCOM conference in Lexington, Kentucky. I'm really looking forward to that. I'm hoping to meet or reconnect with many of the TCOM community members there. Uh, if you have not yet registered for that conference, don't worry, there's still time. There's still plenty of space. Uh, please uh, consider spending a couple of days with us in Lexington. Um, the content is educational, helpful, and the community is one in which uh, not only do we learn a lot, but we also have a lot of fun. So we look forward to seeing as many of you as possible down in Lexington in three weeks. All right, on today's show, we're going to try to answer the question of can EHR or data systems help us see things we may not otherwise see? And to help us answer that question, uh, we've invited Dr. Dan Warner uh, onto our show, and he is uh, a long-standing member of the TCOM community, a person who embraces the idea of mass collaboration, and he's been a leading voice in innovation in this community for the past 15 years or so. Um, he is the co-founder and executive director of Community Data Roundtable in Pittsburgh, PA, and he's going to share with us today his data system, his ideas around design, his approaches to using advanced analytics and decision support. And so without further ado, please welcome onto the program uh, Dr. Dan Warner. Welcome, Dan. Good to see you. Hey, thanks. Thanks. Everyone can, you can hear me? I can hear you now. All right. <laughs> so that's good. So uh, Dan, uh, let's jump right in. One of the things that um, I think you and I have discussed in the past though, is the uh, people spend a lot of time in front of computer systems and in medical record systems, EHR systems, data systems these days, perhaps more than they would like to sometimes. Um, and so from your perspective as a person who runs a system, designs a system, develops systems, you know, how do we make that time meaningful? How do we make that time feel that it's work that's part of a transformational process and not just data entry? Yeah, uh, it's, it's, it's a great question because as a uh, digital part of healthcare continues to grow, there are continued demands to uh, integrate with these systems, which are incredibly powerful. And they become so powerful that when they don't work, we get upset with them because we right. become dependent on them in, in, in various ways. But if they, they have to, they have to really facilitate the work we have to do. Um, I have uh, was uh, primarily how I got drawn into the TCOM world is I was a clinical director of a multi-level mental health practice that stretched across several counties. And I'd always been trained in my clinical psychology training, which is my background. You can't measure people. Everyone's an individual. Um, numbers always miss things, which is 100% true. But what, the moment I was put into a leadership position over some 5,000 clients, I just couldn't know everyone fully. Right. And so I needed um, a, a system that could summarize clinical situations so I could be helpful, uh, could aggregate clinical situations so I can understand things on the large scale. And uh, that's really where I was brought into uh, the CANs and the ANSA, because those are very good tools if you want to be able to both know an individual where you're working directly with that client and you've got a nice structured approach for under getting all the fundamental uh, information that you need. So that's why the CANS and ANSA, and I've always said this, CANS and ANSA is uh, understood and appreciated by clinicians right away. Because mm -hmm. they say, oh, you mean this is a system for me to, be, to do a biopsychosocial assessment? Okay, that's great, because I needed to know what you guys wanted to know. Mm -hmm. The scientists, you know, the psychologists, the lab people, they're like, you're not controlling, th it doesn't matter, because clinicians, for what the CANS and ANSA are meant to do, which is give you that assessment, orient your treatment, you just need to make a digital tool in your EHR or, you know, with our data pool, with our ass software, other tools out there that makes it, stru structures a process that needs to happen in your agency. And then when, after you do that, you can then look at the data and that's the fruit of it. That's right. really the fruit of it. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, for many people, myself included, when we first started using these tools, 
Yeah, certainly there's always this trepidation of I have a way of doing my work. I don't want people me people messing with that, right? My process, my approach, my clinical approach. Uh, and so the idea that this tool is not intended to change the way you work, right? But it does help you stay organized in your work, right? And it can help you communicate your work more effectively, right? And so a lot of that, that organizational process, that communication process is really that intersection point with data systems and EHR systems, like you pointed out. So, so what the, I know I do want to get a look at your system. That's kind of the highlight for me, honestly. But just are there some guiding design principles that uh, come into play when you think about how you put on not only CDR's system together, but just overall when you look at data systems and think about this work? Um, at, you know, there's a, a million of them, right? But at, at the beginning of everything, and I think we all agree in this field, user experience, hmm. UX. You are trying to facilitate a certain process. EHRs, electronic health records, are built around a billing system. Right. They are built to schedule someone, get them into the office and give them the procedure, send out that billing code. And they, they do that excellently. That's why they have taken over healthcare in the last 30 years. That's different than what we think about at CDR when we're trying to make a system that helps bring people together across multiple disciplines and silos, um, go through that. Uh, TCOM process correctly. So you have all the information you need that are right there at hand and then produce reports helpful for your treatment planning and for the families. So the design principle we've had to put into experience is what is what do people need for that? Right. What do people need for their scoring of the cans and the ANSA and for getting the information they need and then for managing? And that's one of the central principles we've built the our software. Nice. I think that's a user experience, right? I think that's as counterposed against the idea of like, how do we do effective billing? Uh, maybe that is really the crux there. All right, so great. So if you don't mind, it would be great to maybe look at uh, the system and uh, you know, um, indulge my narcissism. Help Absolutely. bring that up for us. Uh, great, there we go. All right, okay. so tell us what we're looking at here, Dan. All right, so this is the dashboard in our software, the data pool. And it's meant to be a high level summary of, and it, well, and that's exactly right. Is it your program? you get the same kind of dashboard, but with that information. Is it your caseload? You get this information all the way up to systems planners. We all try to have this uniform approach. Um, uh, I should highlight here that all of this stuff is up based in the original uh, TCOM reports, and they are all down here. You're gonna, if those people who are familiar with average impact and multi-level collaborate, collaboration and all these reports, and those are very necessary for deep diving, but you and I, when we were talking, I, I, we were talking about, let's show just this entryway and this high level approach to looking at my system. So what I'm looking at right now is I'm a supervisor of two programs, something called family-based, something called IBHS. Okay. And just for the audience's sake, just so they know too, and I know you know, so this is all kind of, this is the playground or the sandbox. This is all fake data we're looking at here. Oh my gosh, yes, right. this is completely fake data. Thank yeah. you. For <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so this flow of these three graphs has become very central to us. The first thing we wanna know is what does it look like as people are coming in to my programs? Um, every quarter by quarter by quarter, we look at how many children or families are coming in and then we slice them into four levels based on an, an analytics of cans. Mm -hmm. uh, what is fundamentally going on here is we're splitting them up based on their risk domain score, because that's a nice high level um, assessment of someone's risk. And we've done a lot of analysis that shows that the domain that is most predictive of rise in other domains is the risk domain. So it's a very helpful logic for splitting people up into your ones, which is no actionable risks, all the way up to your fours, which are your more than two actionable risks. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and I think, you know, it is interesting, like we're always trying to find entry points about, you know, in a comprehensive assessment that covers a lot of information, where, where's the starting point to help us think about the population we serve and maybe start to do some differentiation and say, you know, where, and so this, the, your idea around risk, um, is not one that I'm, I, uh, I've seen in a lot of other systems, but it is compelling to think, well, this might be one way in which we try to think about how we do some of this triage and how we organize some of the work we're trying to do with uh, individuals. Yeah. And actually just even to speak to that, and I mean, we have John here, so I mean, I wonder if he can comment. 
One of the things that I have noticed that's very smart about the way the cans came out out of the gate and the answer is it breaks things up into problem presentation, risk, and functioning. Those are the domains, right? And those same domains are very often written into regulations. If you want to get such and such Medicaid service in this state, you got to have a mental health diagnosis, you got to have proof of a functional deficit, and you've got to have some risk factors for just determining level of care. So that's one of the reasons the CAN so nicely plugs into system planning, because it already has ways of very quickly identifying fundamental features uh, in the Medicaid system, behavioral yeah. health system. And, you know, even in the child welfare system, you know, the analysis I had done years ago that was around where the, the lever seemed to tip uh, in moving kids from family-based care um, to community care or group-based care, and it was around risk, right? That that was where the scale started to tip to say those youth might benefit more from settings uh, where there's more supervision, um, uh, more supports. Um, so I do, I do think there's evidence on both sides, right? Behavioral health uh, and child welfare. You know, to that same point, up here we have what we call our focal points. Okay. which is some of the most important data elements to monitor in, when you're managing your TCOM system, making sure it's compliant in various ways. But this one, I'll show you right here when you log in, it gives you a list, and in my fake example, I've only got one, of your people with the highest risk. And we have a certain algorithm for that. This was derived through analysis of our data, but we're looking for people who have either multiple threes and a high risk domain score. This is a very unique high level risk. But uh, in our workflows, when we train new users, hmm. we train them to start with emergent risk. These are your highest risk kids. Do you need to talk to the clinician? Make sure you know what's going on with them. Do you have to put some notes on any given items for the next time someone rates the cans on this child that they know some details? Or do you just even want to give a note to yourself, just something about what's going on? And people, we got asked for that. People, people use that a lot. It's funny. Um, so once again, cans is so good has multiple approaches to identify, I say cans, I mean cans and ANSA, multiple right. approaches to identifying what is risky. And then you using analytics and us using analytics have sort of tried to find different populations for different needs. Nice. All right, so I'm in here, we're at this big kind of program level. We're looking at these initial, uh, initial ways of thinking about our work and organizing. Where, where are we seeing change come in here? Well, I'm glad you asked. So in our second right. pie called the client change, what we have done is it's very simple. What I find at the highest level, which is where we are right now, and you saw right. we've got a lot of reports for diving. But fundamentally, what we do is we look with from, we take the furthest cans overall in whatever we filter down to two years back, and then the most recent. So you need two measures of cans or ANSA, and we're looking at a two-year period. In this example, you see we have 47 clients who have met that criteria. And I want to know, from that initial, do they have more actionable needs, less actionable needs, or the same? Right. And in general, you want to have more green pie. Now, there's a lot of variations, and there's programs with exceptions that you can look at, and then you dive into that. But right. as a general pulse on your system, this is very effective. I would agree. I think, yeah, very high level. How are we doing? Are we resolving needs, enhancing strengths? These are really simple conversations to have with people and invite them in. Great. All right. So we got those first two. And then um, that last one, there's this caseload. Uh, talk to us about that. Okay. So this is the fun. Now, so this is how are people coming in. Are they right. changing? Things are looking good. Now let's get to work. That This is your active caseload over here, split up by risk. And you can see, even though on the left, when people primarily come into me with pink, my largest group that's still in care is that lavender group. So okay. that's already an improvement from three to twos, but twos are still risky. Let's take a look at these. Let's take a look at these cases. So we, we're going to log in here. We can see our different, uh, different people, who are all my twos. I'm looking at my twos, and because I have a little client set up for us, because this is all fake, of course. So let's take a look at a client in detail. So we start with some information up top, like their diagnoses. We do treat this as a clinical tool and try to regularly encourage updated diagnoses to be brought in. So that gets brought in here. We get a sense for how long someone's been in care. 
um, if they uh, what services they're getting. Then these um, these analytics. Once again, why Kansas is so powerful? We talked about severity score, but now autism score. Using the cans, we break up the ASD population and help with putting it into ASD level one, two, or three, as it's colloquially used in the treatment community. Right. And right. then you can also draw in based on intellectual impairment and language problems. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, no, no. I think that's fast. So that's just taking the information here, giving the people a quick synopsis. I do like that kind of that autism score being right up front there. Yeah. And this is something that's, you know, numbers are in so many ways very scary. Um, and especially the level of ASD has all the makings to be politicized. Oh, mm -hmm. you know, for all various reasons. So one of the things that TCOM tools do wonderfully is make transparent these processes and objective. Yeah. So that's what we really reach for there. Then we get into the details. What we have here in that line graph that you see there is we break up the, the, the assessment, the CANS, the ANSA, into its domains. Blue is your mental health needs, your problem presentation. Orange is your caregiver needs. Uh, red is risk and black is functioning. And then before we do it, as we do an implementation, most especially nowadays, uh, there's some groups, I guess, that are fresh, but many implementations that we come in already have CANS data. So one of the first things we do is we analyze it and identify for each domain based on age bands and gender, we break it up. What are the percentiles? So what is bad? What does the worst look like in your network versus uh, the, the, the least clinical? And this really helps uh, situate the case. So as you can see in our example here, this is a client with very high mental health needs in the 96th percentile. Um, however, their functioning deficits are more in the 54th percentile, still high and on the top half. Um, but this is a different kind of case than where things reorganize. And this is a very often a part of how uh, to inform your understanding of the case in regards to the larger context. That's fascinating. I think, too, that it's not something traditionally we think about when we're thinking about trying to do individual uh, level results, right? Which is like, you know, how do I create simple draft graphs that help me track change over time with that individual? <coughs> but then sometimes put that in a larger context of either the rest of my work or the rest of the work going on in the agency that there's, you know, it's maybe not necessarily for that individual, but for the clinician, the worker doing that to try to keep in context, like, okay, so this, this work feels hard. And the reason it may feel hard is because this person falls into the highest percentile on needs level, those kind of little metrics sometimes I would imagine can help people feel supported in the work they do. And in addition to helping us track that progress, right? Yes. And it also really helps for conversations about why is this child still with us? Right. You know, right. everything is resolved. They're no longer depressed and anxious. Yeah. Well, look at the risk score. Yeah. What happened there with exploitation or abuse or, you know, let's look at the functioning score. There's, you know, been a, a major spike in school problems. So it, it, quickly it gives us the ability to understand things well i thought things are getting better over here yeah but there's also over here and we can compare it right yeah. all right well i'll keep going down thank you so yeah, much yeah. so let's go back because i do think that's a that's a good first graph and you know, one of the things that we we talked about before is um you know i i like kind of taking your time looking through this because i do think sometimes if you've seen it for the first time it takes a little bit to uh, make heads or tails of things but also um, I'm always presented with this kind of question in trainings is like, well, what will the cans do for me? And the, or what does the answer do for me? And so, uh, mostly I, I chuckle at that question. Like it doesn't, you know, won't cook you breakfast or, you know, make you a pot of coffee, but it <laughs> does, uh, and if anyways, you know, you are still doing all the work. It's like, how does this data system help us see things that a little bit more clearly and that clear, like those visualizations, what percentile you're in, how we're tracking you know, just change over time in the different domains. So it's a really helpful in thinking about in doing this work, how can this help me see things that I may have lost sight of or it, through my day-to-day -day work, just keep track of these things that are important to track. Yeah, and and it, and it speaks also to uh, the value as you were talking about, how do we make an electronic experience valuable right. in our work? One of the places we are so focused at our organization is the supervisors, the people who have to administer multiple clinicians. Um, I do a monthly office hours. People who use our app can come and ask questions. And it's 
75% of the time, it's supervisors. And we look at the caseloads of the people under them. Now the aggregation really matters and really makes a lot of sense. Because if a bunch of your clients have a certain profile, that's telling you something. You can also look at your different caseloads of the different clinicians and compare them to each other. Say, oh, well, this person has a harder uh, load overall than this one. So right. um, just to speak into what makes it, if you make it actionable, right? This is what we always know. It's based on action. And that's what we're always trying to do with our application. Excellent. So what just uh, walk through, I don't know what we have coming next, but I really mentioned too, and kind of ways in which we might use some of this data stuff to engage the youth, the family, that individual, that's part, you know, that we're working in partnership with, or the things that the data system can do for them. Yeah, that's one of our key goals. And that's one of the central things that makes things relevant is when you get it to the family. How is it relevant to the family? Well, here's one example of how we try to do that. Um, we have a, so yeah, I'll show that in a second. So we have a summary report called the take home report. I think you're seeing it right now. Is that right? Yes, I am. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can summary report. So we present here the information with as few numbers as possible. These numbers are, you know, official numbers you're seeing right. here, risk severity and autism level. But as I'll show you in a second, uh, numbers make people paranoid. Numbers quickly lead people to start competing. Do we want to get the highs? Do we want to get the lows? And one of the things that is true, and in fact, uh, Dr. Lyons talked about this, oh man, it was uh, at that uh, California conference years ago now. Uh, there's a way you can sometimes think about CAN's numbers, the zero, one, two, three, almost as nominal data, as just labels of things. Uh, there's definitely a severity part to it, but but we use the numbers to, to designate, oh, this is something I need to do something about. This, right. this is something I don't need to do something about. It's actionable. It's meaningful. So when we do reports for people, we want to focus on getting the meaning, not the numbers. So when they score at these certain levels, we explain exactly what that means in a family-friendly language. That's also why we have it translatable to Spanish because uh, a lot of the communities where we work are, in fact, Spanish speaking. So we wanted this report to be available to them in Spanish. Then what we do, as you see right here, we take the twos and the threes, which I think people on this phone call will know what that means. Right. Um, but we put it in language that has nothing to do with numbers. So just you've got problem presentation problems and we list out here um, in as clear language as we can. These are the things that we need to work on, mom and dad. Get the face validity. Um, does this make sense to you? And we need intensive help on this particular problem. We also say, hey, you know, there's been a lot of improvements. We can track improvements and you want to celebrate things that have gone right. And you even, and we we train what can uh, the, the clinicians to say, hey, what was it here that there was family problems that have gotten better? What, what was that back then? Or if you were the therapist, you can say, remember when we had this conflict and now yins have worked it out? Uh, yins is y'all in the uh, Pittsburgh East. But, right? um, uh, you know, it's, we see we're getting more involved in care. That was really an accomplishment, mom and dad. Thanks so much for doing that with us. We, we make a report that's meant to give opportunities for what's going right to be celebrated. Yeah, I mean, I love the first time you showed this to me, I loved it. I think, you know, again, it meets the two goals, right? Does it help me be organized in my work? And does it help me communicate my work, right? And if we can do those things in ways that feel not about numbers, then invite people into conversations and help those conversations stay organized around that change process. I mean, that's the beauty of something like this. Um, and, you know, uh, not to oversell it, right? But this is, you know, not every, all data systems have this. And even this design of this, um, is not the easiest thing in the world, right? Even though it seems very simplistic, it is not a simple process. And so um, talk to me, because I know that, you know, it, at CDR, you guys go through a process of trying to really get uh, input from um, the community that you work with, not only the providers, but also families, individuals. And so talk to me a little bit about how those designs come together. Yes, you know, we're, we're in a constant, whenever we come, we, we, in many of our implementations, we're there to support a TCOM implementation, and of course, with our software. And then in those implementations of stakeholder groups, those are opportunities to go directly to the people who will be using it. And when it works out to have family groups. So one of the insurance companies uh, in Pennsylvania, we work with Perform Care. They have a consumer family group that we were able to meet with and run this, uh, run this uh, report through while we were developing it. 
a different later iteration, because this is an ongoing process, was actually shared with a, the Idaho group. Uh, I guess they have a family, the Yes Initiative, if I'm remembering, yeah. Um, yep. group. That was, a, that was a spirited conversation about this report. Um, we've... And then we also had a group, there was some other group, uh, some other, ad, you know, we have different advocacy uh, yeah. groups we get to touch uh, with at various times. So we always take as much as we can, take it to the consumers and get their feedback. And we did get a lot of feedback that was incorporated into this on language and on what information should be on it. Uh, for instance, in some implementations, we put the diagnosis on there and mm -hmm. some implementations don't like it. And that was literally based on feedback from different groups. Yeah, I think that that's a critical step, right? The design process doesn't have to be one that is generated solely by experts sitting in a room. In fact, and that's the hardest way to do it is just trying to use the developers as people who are doing design work, but really to partner, like with everything else, right? To, to create a mass collaboration on what is a way to present information that really helps us not only make decisions but track our ability to progress, uh, to make progress. All right, so I'm conscious of our time. There's one other thing I'm really hoping you can uh, show us. And that is that how there's a connection between assessment and planning and sometimes the decision support that's really baked into your system that might guide people towards decisions around interventions. Um, and so um, I know there's a, I don't know how to get there, but I know there's a, a way you can get there to show me some of that stuff Oh, absolutely. Uh, around your evidence-based practice work. Yeah, absolutely. Great. So after you have your form filled out, it's run through various algorithms of service matching. And we've got a, a whole manual on how we've made algorithms based on important evidence-based practices that are out there. A famous one, of course, is MST. Sure. And this particular client, Phantom Dan, as you see, matches here with um, this particular program based on the scores. So it's not a gross tool. It's not a tool that's generally... One of the things... Let me even just say this. Um, before I was brought into the TCOM fold, I was looking at a tool called the Locus, uh, which some people on this phone call might know. And there was also, oh, what is that? that uh, there's that case management risk adjudication tool. And those tools are built on uh, national norms, and that's what they really try to plug. And then they generally, but what they're able to generally tell you is this kid looks like a high risk kid. This kid looks like a low risk kid, you know. Um, very general statements. What the TCOM approach really allows, just like you saw with the percentiles earlier, is we're going to look at your population. When you see multisystemic therapy here, this algorithm was built with stakeholders from the local community, including consumers, just like you were, we were talking about earlier. That's, uh, uh, it was actually, I think, a different pool of consumers, but they were involved. Um, and the providers, as you can see, we're not just generally linking you to some program. We're linking you to multisystemic therapy in this area. Here's the contact information. And so it makes it a much more meaningful and localized truth. Uh, it doesn't even take that much more work to do it because TCOM has all the tools you need. But then we build locally relevant algorithms for the system of care here and really help facilitate connection to programs. And we've uh, we've have research that shows we've we had a, a, a statistically significant but also system meaningful impact on the increase of appropriate prescriptions of MST. Uh, more people were identified for MST, who benefited from it, and who went to MST. And the MST outcomes, because they measure their own outcomes, were that those kids got better. Right. So um, it, it was, it's, it's, it's really, a, it's a successful process. Right. I mean, that is the shared idea. So I would like, as a clinician, as a newer clinician, especially, I wanted someone to help me make decisions um, so that I could, because my goal was to help that individual or that family. And so if there's the collective expertise that is built into your decision support algorithms, can it be delivered uh, to a person in that doing the work day to day in a way in real time that helps them do decision support? I think that's a win for everyone, right? That's a win for the person who's trying to be the helper. That's a win for the family who's looking for something to, to help. Um, and that's the, I mean, I really do think that's the, the role for data systems is to provide an organization place to support quality decision making and make the work efficient, right? In many ways. So um, that's awesome. And thank you so much for kind of showing us that stuff. There's one final question I really kind of want to 
uh, get your sense of it. It's what's new and exciting for you to kind of keep you going after all these years in doing this work. And where do you see kind of the field moving forward in the next couple of years or year or so or things that you have on the horizon? Yeah, well, I, I'm sure I, I speak in some part for you and your team. We're just getting started, right? I mean, it's we've gotten the we're, we're, we, the barn has been raised, but now we get to farm. Yeah, you know, right. uh, <laughs> uh, there's so much exciting stuff going on in regards to the fact that we now have systems that have been in place for about 10 years, right? Or something like that. Some, yeah. some longer, some, some lesser, but, and now let's look at it and start doing stuff. Yeah. And, and our field is an absolute crisis. I don't need to tell you that no, we, no, no. We, yeah. uh, the need has never been higher and the supply of labor has never been lower. And um, it's a, we have to figure out, how we're going to address this need with the resources we have, because we're not about to manufacture people out of nowhere. No. Yeah. And that is some of the big projects we're working on. I'm presenting at the TCOM conference in a couple of weeks here on uh, value-based purchasing and some models I've been a part of. What does that mean? What that means is you've got to make some new programs. No matter where you work in this country right now, we need some new programs because we are overwhelmed. Well, what do we need? Do we need a crisis walk-in? Do we need more outpatient clinics? Do we need BCBAs? Your CANS data, your ANSA data that you've been collecting is the answer, has the answers. Mm -hmm. You need to look at it, work, you know, do it and get moving. And that's what's happening everywhere we work and we're, we're very excited about it. That's awesome. Well, one, I, that sounds exciting to me. It also sounds exciting that we'll be able to hear that uh, presentation at the TCOM conference. I'll definitely be there for that. Um, so I know, and I do, I did put a plug this morning that you have, uh, there's something else at the conference that you're, you're sponsoring. Uh, here's a good spot for advertising. Uh, I will for say, so if you're like me, you've been coming to the TCOM conference for God knows how, oh, 10 years and such. And it's Long really time. a wonderful time to get together with other professionals in this field. And what's more fun and getting to, oh, and also whenever we go somewhere, you know, I'd like to know what the indigenous story is there. What is the autochthonous the flavor. story? Um, and so in Kentucky, it is bourbon is what I have learned. So we're, we'll, we'll be having a little get together at our suite where we'll be having bourbon tastings, but also bourbon balls, which is apparently a big local thing, something called that. a derby pie, which goes very well with bourbon and then beer cheese, because yes, that's apparently big there. And you've won me over with the beer and the cheese. All right. Well, that sounds, that sounds exciting. So for any of you there watching this video, if you like subscribe and comment. Uh, I think that puts you to the top of Dan's right list to the about getting in there for yeah. the Derby pie. And yeah. the Before you come into my suite, you will need to show me your YouTube app that, and I need to see you've liked. Uh, that sounds like a, a good plan to me. Well, Dan, thank you so much. And part, I know this is a little bit last minute. You were able to come on. We had someone else kind of drop off. It's always great to talk to you. I agree. I, every time we discuss things, I always learn more and more. And so it's a pleasure. Thank you so much. And I look forward to seeing you in Lexington in a couple of weeks. Great. Thank you for everything. Nice seeing you. All too. right. Good to see you, Dan. All right. Well, that wraps our show for today. Thank you all for uh, joining and kind of tuning in. And if you weren't here live, uh, thanks for kind of tuning in afterwards. A couple plugs uh, before we wrap up. Uh, so the first one, uh, I want to just mention that on the uh, TCOM channel, they'll be launching soon another episode of the Let's Talk About It, the conversations between QIs that are qualified individuals who under the Family First Preservation Services Act are doing work to support quality decision making for kids in congregate care. So if you're a QI, if you're curious about the, the work of QIs, please tune in to that. Additionally, um, we have another episode that uh, I think in the last week or so that we launched of the podcast Tales from the Collaborative. That's Tim Fall's conversation with past TCOM champion award winners. And so the last conversation was with our good friend Ken from New Jersey who, uh, it, please take a listen. It's always uh, great to hear Ken's voice and his humor. Um, and so I thought that was a wonderful listen. So that's the Tales from the Collaborative. Uh, please kind of, if you have an Instagram account, um, uh, please connect with us over Instagram. It's another way to stay in touch with all the work happening at the IF Center. If you don't have an Instagram account, uh, maybe get one. And that way you can connect with us on Instagram. And then finally, the last plug is for our conference, as I mentioned before. You still have time. Uh, the QR code is there. Please register and uh, we look forward to seeing you in Lexington. I think it's going to be a good time. All right. Well, thank you again for joining us. Our next episode of Tales from the Collaborative is going to be on November 14th. We'll be kind of taking a month for the conference, but then we'll be back 
November 14th. That's the second Tuesday of the month, 3 p.m. Eastern, noon Central. Um, and I'd like to thank uh, everyone who makes the show possible. So that's uh, Tim Fall, Zach Schutman, Lauren Mergen, and a uh, big thanks this time to Kyle Sprague, who kind of chipped in and is running all the background on this stuff. So thank you tremendously, Kyle and everyone else. All right. I hope you all have a, rest, a great rest of the day. And thanks for tuning in to Connecting the Dots. We'll see you next time.